Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to our Sunday morning service uh, via Facebook and YouTube. Sorry we couldn't get together today. The snow, uh, a lot of uh, snow removal still has to take place, and we didn't have enough parking available at the church, so we just decided to do it online for everybody's safety and sake today. So I hope you can join us. I'm glad you'd be with us. I'm going to open up in prayer, have a message, and then go back to shoveling and digging out. <laughs> so I uh, hope you're all safe and uh, looking forward to today's message. And uh, let's just pray together now. Father, thank you <clears throat> for this time. Uh, we pray that everyone is safe through the storm, Lord, that nobody got hurt shoveling. And, uh, we pray that you would make provisions for those who are... Uh, not able to shovel and need to be shoveled out, Lord, bring people by and, and provisions by for that. Uh, we pray for those still battling COVID this morning, you would heal them, bring them back to 100% health, Lord. Uh, we pray for uh, Pastor Harry Weisskopf, we just got word he's out in um, Illinois, and he you know, was rushed to the hospital this morning with a uh, aneurysm in his brain and uh, stroke and uh, we just pray that uh, you would get him to the right doctors give them wisdom and discernment Lord and let there be nothing uh, uh, long standing with this and uh, that it would be something that could be handled quickly and treated uh, fast Lord bring him back 100% bless Pastor Jack special this morning give him peace we lift up the word to you this morning and ask your blessing upon it, Lord. Um, teach us what you would want us to know this morning. Uh, let it uh, set people free. Let it uh, cause us to think differently uh, towards you, about ourselves, and uh, let it um, do its work that you promised, Lord, in Isaiah. And so we ask you to bless it in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, if you have Bibles uh, today and you want to follow along, we're going to be in two portions, Isaiah 43 and um, 2 Corinthians 5.21. And I, I, we talked Wednesday about uh, this message and that I was preparing it, uh, and uh, so I'm going to preach on it, and um, it's going to be about righteousness and sin, and um one you might think you're very familiar with and the other not so much, but I want to look at it in a way that helps us this morning um, because I think we all have a difficult time with righteousness relating to it. Uh, we give up on it because we think or we know who we are in our sin nature and we keep falling and we don't feel righteous, we don't feel holy. And so, therefore, we have a, a concept of it and a wish that we could be like it, but we know we're not, so we, we don't even entertain it in our thought life or in our lives, for that matter. And so we need to uh, understand, uh, first of all, what is righteousness? When we talk about righteousness, Jesus said to the, to the disciples in Matthew 5.20, Except your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you can in no wise enter the kingdom of God. And this was shocking to them because to them the, the, there was no greater righteousness than that of the Pharisees. And the Pharisees liked to tell everybody how righteous they were. Look at me, I pray. Look at me, I tithe. Look at me, I'm dressed up in all robes. Look at me, I have the word of God hanging before my eyes. Look at me, I'm not like you. We know the stories in the Bible. And so people would look at that and say, well, now Jesus says, except your righteousness exceeds that of what you're seeing and what you're understanding, you can in no wise enter. So that must have left them with like, well, there's no hope at all. Because they're viewpoint and concept of righteousness was what they saw in the Pharisees. And that is, that's a form of godliness, but it denies the power thereof. It is, it is a self-righteousness, and we know this, 
They were living in self-righteousness. And we'll see what God says about that in a minute. But, but that goes back to, so what is righteousness then? We could, how, could, how do we define righteousness? Well, righteousness has uh, many different meanings. Uh, the, one of the main meanings of righteousness is equity. Equity. What is equity? Equity. I have equity in my house, which means what? I have value. I owe less on it than what it's worth, so if I sell it, um, I get the money, uh, the difference between what I owe and what I can sell it for, and that's called a profit, but, it's, but in terms of real estate, it's called equity. I have equity, so I can take out a loan against the equity in my house. It's the value of my house minus the debt. Equity. Uh, equity is a word that's being thrown out in the world today a lot. Um, uh, in different social circles. They, we, uh, you hear it on commercials and you see people say, we just want to have an equitable society. We, which means what? They want everything to be fair, is what they're, they're trying to say. Uh, we want everybody to be treated the same. And this is not a bad thing, but this is a definition of righteous. That's what it means. To be righteous means to be equitable to be fair, to be just, to be true. This is righteousness. Um, uh, and, and when we look at the righteousness of God, then we have a, a, a standard that goes beyond the righteousness of the Pharisees and all that they could do, or my righteousness, or self-righteousness. You and I live by a code of righteousness. It's called morality. Morality is that part of my conscience that knows the difference between right and wrong. Right, righteousness, wrong, sin. I know if I do something um, that it's wrong. So if I want to continue to do it and feel right about it, I must call that wrong right. And then if that, that wrong becomes righteous or equitable. And this is what's happening in the world today. In the Bible called it, thousands of years ago. Uh, behold, uh, uh, woe unto them that call good evil and evil good. That, that make righteousness the same as evil uh, or the same as sin. And it's, it is not. Uh, so righteousness is a standard that we sometimes set up for ourselves and we compare ourselves with others. Relative righteousness, we call it. Me comparing what I do good compared to what someone else does good, and I, I, I measure myself or them, and I come up with a place on a scale that puts me ahead of them, which is what my goal is uh, if I'm a self-righteous person, or behind them, and I try to attain them to their righteousness, like the disciples with the Pharisees. See? So, uh, righteousness of God is the standard of holiness that God has. And nobody can attain to that. Nobody can do any works that would make themselves equal or equitable to God. So we give up trying to be righteous. When, when we go to churches and we hear preachers talking about the, uh, living righteously, and we say, I tried, but I can't. And many of us do try. We try not to do wrong, and we try to behave ourselves, and we try to bite our tongue, and we try to, to, to not uh, enter into sin, and, and then it fails, and we condemn ourselves, and we go, I can't, I can't be righteous. I'm not righteous. And, and basically what you're saying is a truth. You aren't. You can't. And, and good for us when we come to that place. But, but the problem is, is when we come to that place, we end up condemning ourselves and not forgiving ourselves and not realizing this point that I want to make today about sin and righteousness to help us understand it a little bit. So let me read you some verses in Isaiah 43, and we'll end up in 2 Corinthians 5.21, and, and we'll go from there. Uh, so, in Isaiah 43, verse 21, this, this is God speaking, and he says, This people have I formed for myself, speaking of, of the children of Israel, this people have I formed for myself, they shall show forth my praise. 
they shall go forth my praise. This is a declaration by God. I have formed this people for myself. This people that he was talking to at this moment were living in idolatry. They were wandering away from God. They were living in rebellion. But God is making a statement. This people have I formed. The word formed there is he's talking about uh, just the other parts of the scriptures where God says, I am the potter, you are the clay. Can the thing formed say to him that forms it, what makest thou? You know, so here God's saying, I have this people, I have formed for myself. I have created them. I have made them. I have separated them. They are mine in the beginning of this chapter. Uh, they are mine. You are mine. Okay? Uh, they shall show forth my praise, a declaration. Not they might show forth my praise, or if they do this, they'll show forth my praise. If they act righteously, they'll show forth my praise. No, they shall show forth my praise. We are, you and I, in the body of Christ in the church today, which is uh, the inward, uh, or the modern day manifestation of the children of Israel, we're the church of God, the bride of Christ. And we are designed the same way. We have been set apart by God, and we shall show forth his praise. We shall come to a place, because it's God's plan, that we will praise him. That we, and it's good to praise the Lord. It's good to praise the Lord for all of his benefits, for what he has done. Some people uh, look at all their problems, and they have a hard time praising the Lord. They don't see the goodness of God, but the goodness of God is everywhere. And we can't look at trials and tribulations and, and say, where is God? But yet people do that. But anyways, uh, he goes on in, in the next verse. says, But thou hast not called upon me, O Jacob, but thou hast been weary of me, O Israel. Uh, the, again, stating the condition of their souls. Uh, he created them, he made them, he separated them, he called them out of Egypt, he delivered them out of the Egyptians' hands, he gave, delivered them to a promised land, and he, he gave them all provisions. He was the, they were the apple of his eye, and still are. And it says, yet you have not called upon me. How sad it is for a, a Christian to go through their walk and they stop calling upon God. Maybe when you first got saved, you all praise God. I'm so happy. I have peace. God's wonderful. Let me tell you about God. And this, everything's great. And then, then the, the details of life come along and you get busy with your life. And then you, you become just like this. You, you stop calling upon God. Uh, you become weary of him. Oh, I got to go to church again. Oh, I got to read the Bible. Oh, I got to pray. Oh, I don't have time to do all these things. I don't, I don't have time. I'm busy. Uh, God understands, doesn't he? And you say, well, yes, God understands everything. He understands that you're flopping him at that moment. Because there's always time to praise the Lord. There's always time for God in your life. We have the same 24 hours as everybody else does. And I can, I can give God my time and my energy and do all those other things and trust God for the balance. And there is right there with God. Mm -hmm. And so, but, this, but see how God knows the condition and what they're thinking in their heart. You, are, you have not called upon me and you are, you are weary of me. Imagine God knowing that about ourselves in our hearts, that we are weary of God. And he goes on to say, Thou hast not brought me the small cattle of thy burnt offerings, neither hast thou honored me with thy sacrifices. Uh, this is very quickly, uh, the small cattle of the burnt offerings was what was required when people sinned. Uh, you, when you sin, you must bring an offering, sacrifice. Uh, the sacrifice uh, um, was an optional one. I've, I've, I've done my duty and I have made up for my sin by bringing the small cattle, but I want to continue to sacrifice to God, and I will sacrifice even more to Him. Uh, some people, for us today, would be like, oh, the Bible says I should tithe uh, in the offering, and that's 10%. I'm going to give 15%. That's the sacrifice. A love sacrifice, we call it. Or, I, uh, you know, I, <clears throat> I've d decided that I'm going to... Go 
to be an hour in the Word, but then maybe I go an hour and a half in the Word because it's just so amazing and so great. And that's the, the, the sacrifice of my heart. I want, to, I want to serve God more. I want to know Him more. Uh, but he says they're not doing either one. They're not doing what's required, and they're not doing what's optional. They're just not doing it at all, and they've stopped. And he, uh, uh, he goes on to say, I have not caused thee to serve with an offering, nor wearied thee with incense. God, their calling to sacrifice was a requirement of the law for sinning. God has not caused me to, to serve with sacrifice. Like God, when they were in captivity, the children of Israel, they were not required to sacrifice. If they wanted to, they could, but they weren't required by God. He said, you do not have to. I understand your situation. You do not have to. Why? Because it, ultimately, it's not about the animal sacrifice with God. It never was. It was just a shadow of something to come later. It was symbolic of what what would be the ultimate sacrifice down the road. So he says this in verse 24, and this is what I wanted to focus on. Thou hast bought me no sweet cane with money, neither hast thou filled me with the fat of thy sacrifices, but thou hast made me to serve with thy sins. Thou hast wearied me with thine iniquities. This is God saying this. Thou hast made me to serve with thy sins. Uh, thou hast wearied me. I have not wearied you, and I have not caused you to serve me uh, in any way, uh, but you, you have caused me to serve with your sins. That's something to really think about for a minute here. God is, we have caused God to serve us with our sins. And we can only go from there to this verse in 2 Corinthians 5.21. For he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. God, God, he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. We know this verse, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Um, when Jesus took on him the sin of the world, and it's the sin of the world, in John 1, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming to be baptized, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God, who taketh away the sin of the world. He did not use the plural. It was, it, 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 it was in the singular. And it wasn't a mistake in the King James Version, uh, because we know there's reference to the sins of the world, or the sins of people, or the sins of Israel, uh, or, uh, but then there's the sin of the world. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he was the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. What is the sin of the world this morning? The whole world. The sin in the whole world. Every person is born with a sin nature. And we all commit sins, don't we? We, we have, like Paul, my sins which were many. I have many sins. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Sometimes when we're, we get overwhelmed with our frailty and our weakness against the holiness or the righteousness of God, we, sit, we feel the same way and say, oh, I have so many sins. Um, and we never classify ourselves in just one category of sin. But here it does. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What is the sin of the world? What was or what is or what, uh, what shall be the sin of the world? That sin that came into Adam um, through the seed and Eve and all mankind, that sin of what? We go back to Adam and Eve at the tree and, and the three things that Eve saw. She saw that the tree was good. She saw that it was desired to make one wise. She saw that it was good to look at. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those three things uh, was what caused her to sin. But the sin was what? 
uh, re rebellion, disobedience. God said, do not eat of that tree. And the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. So she saw she was tempted and enticed by the serpent. And, and the blame game can start all around that. But the sin was the same sin that was found in Satan when iniquity was found in his heart. It was rebellion against God. Simply put, all sin, all of our sins, the sins that we commit, is ultimately uh, boiled down to and, and brought back to an unpeel. If you're unpeeling the whole onion thing and you come to the center, it's the sin of the world which was rebellion against God. Mm -hmm. right? And all sins, whatever they may be, come and stem from that rebellion that's in our heart against God. That's why David said, I have sinned against thee and thee only have I sinned. Okay, because this, he recognized that the sin that he committed, which was adultery and, and lust and, and then ultimately murder, was the manifestation of the sin that is in the whole world. That sin. Um, so whatever sins you've committed and I've committed are all manifestations of that same sin that is in the whole world. And this is what Jesus came to die for. And, so, and it wasn't like this. It wasn't like Jesus said, okay, I'm going to die for your sins, but I really didn't commit them. But I'm going to die for them anyway. And we all oh, thank you, Jesus. You, I, we, you didn't really commit them, but you died for them. But that leaves us with this, this, this little tiny option. If, if the devil wants to have a place and he wants to sneak in, and you got to think with me this morning on this, um, you know, because you, it, it takes some thought here. I, want, I just want to think about this principle. And, and so it will help us with having uh, righteousness in our lives. But, but um, if I classify Jesus dying for me on the cross and apply it to my sins, the manifestation of the problem of sin, uh, then I can, there's an escape clause there. Uh, Jesus, oh, he didn't really sin, uh, which he didn't when he lived in this, this earth. He never sinned once, which is why he could be the perfect sacrifice. But when he took upon him the sin of the world and included all the manifestations of it, yes, my sin, your sin, all the heinous sins we can think of, all the little sins that people commit, the sins of all the world. But the sin was what he took upon himself, the problem that makes the manifestation so varied and all over the place. And, and so we can't label uh, a, a particular sin and say, this is what Christ died for. He died for sin, the sin problem. Mm -hmm. And it might say, well, what's the difference? The difference is this, is that because Christ died for the sin of the world, what does it say? Um, he who knew... He had made him to be sin, not sins, made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made, what? The righteousness of God in him. Not the act of righteousness, the behavior that makes me, that I do a good thing and that makes me feel righteous. Or I look at the Pharisee and he looks righteous because he's got a prayer book in front of his eyes and he's got all these things on that makes him look holy. But no, it's, that's not what Christ died for, so that we could be made to have an act of righteousness, that we could actually, just as he became sin of the whole world, encompassing everything, uh, we, that we could become the righteousness of God. Not righteous, because all of us know that we don't act righteous very much. We don't know how to act righteous sometimes, and when we try to, we fail and we condemn ourselves. So, but he didn't say that you're going to act righteous now. It's not like Christ said, I, I'm going to die for your sins, but I really didn't do them myself. It's just something I'm doing. No, he willingly went to the cross and took on him our sin, the sin of the whole world. And so he became sin, and if you become sin, you are what? Um, it says in Romans 6:16, 6, "Know ye not that to whom you become, 
Let me read it. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? Uh, Jesus Christ became sin, took upon him the sin of the world. Behold, the Lamb of God. He's going to be the sacrifice for the sin, that rebellion, that disobedience towards God in all things, regardless of the manifestation. Uh, and so because he did that, and he didn't just say, I'm doing this, but I didn't really sin. He said, no, I will become that sin for you. Um, he became what? That, think about this. He became the servant of that sin. Uh, in, this, in, the, in the form of the servant of it, he was owing to it, in other words. Owing to it, which means what? He had to pay the wage of that sin, which is death. We know this. The, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So Jesus Christ became servant to God in, go, in the plan to go to the cross, but then became, when he became sin, he became the servant to that sin and fulfilled the obligation of it by paying the wage for it, which was death. Thank you, God, because we couldn't. Perfect sacrifice. Thank you, God. What sin? My sin, yes, but my sin, no, everyone's sin. That's why people go, well, how could God die for the sins past, present, future? Because he, he took upon him the sin problem. The sin that was that caused all the manifestations of sin, he took upon him that sin and went to the cross and died for that sin, that rebelliousness. And we can't even imagine that because we we rebel against God all the time. Like God said to Israel, "You are weary of me, you have not called upon me," and they took it so lightly, like and like like we do today. Like, okay, I haven't prayed in a while, no big deal, but I've done this. Oh, well, what's worse? Really, in our eyes, uh, committing a deed that's a sin uh, manifestation of the sin problem, we deem worse than the problem of the sin to begin with, which is me disregarding God, which is what Israel was doing. Mm -hmm. and, and that, to God, is a bigger deal, and that is what Jesus died for. So we all get hung up over these manifestations of sin. Oh, look at that sinner. Look at that. That's what the Pharisees did, by the way, too, which made them look even more holier. Yet they pointed out everybody's manifestations of their sin without looking at it. And that's why Jesus called them out. He said, you are whited sepulchers. You have a sin problem in your heart, and you're trying to point at the manifestations of that sin problem, and you're not dealing with the sin problem yourself. Why do you think it is that be, uh, take out... The, uh, before you try and take out the splinter out of your brother's eye, take out the beam that's in your own. The beam being the sin problem that makes you think you can judge and makes you think you can do this because you're looking at manifestations and comparing it in relative righteousness. But Christ took upon him the sin problem. And so he died and he became the servant of sin. And that's why, and, and that, go back to verse 24, thou has made me to serve with thy sins, okay? He became a servant, Philippians 2, 5 through 7. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, he was equal with God, but humbled himself and took upon him the form of a servant, the form of a servant, and became obedient even unto the death of the cross. Why? Because the servant, he, was, he took upon him the sin of the world and had to become servant to that sin and die the, way, the, the penalty of that sin, which is death. And he, we know the story. He went to the cross. He was beaten and whipped and tortured and all of that. And nobody could endure that, but he did it for our sin, the sin problem of the world. Now, we say all this to say this that we might become the righteousness of God. Not act righteous, not be righteous like the Pharisees, but become the righteousness of God. Let me read this to you uh, about that. The righteousness of God, not merely righteous, but righteousness itself. Not merely righteousness itself, but the righteousness of God, because Christ is God, 
and what he is we are, 1 John 4, 17. He is made of God unto righteousness, as our sin is made over to him, so is righteousness to us. As our sin is made over to him, he took upon him the sin of the world, so his righteousness, not an act, not a behavioral thing, not a feeling. His righteousness, that part of God that is right and true and good and just and fair and equitable, he, he, took, he has given it over to us. It's the great transference. transference I'm sorry. Uh, he who became uh, rich, he who was rich became poor so that we who were poor might become rich. This is the verse. Right? He who is rich, God, Jesus Christ, rich in everything, not just money, but everything, became poor for our sakes, that we who were poor, who had nothing to offer God, might become rich. Not might, that you may be. You will, if you receive Christ as your Savior, you become a child of God, you instantly are rich in God, rich in heaven, rich in eternal things. You might still go through life and struggle financially, but you are rich. I don't know if you realize that. Many Christians don't. Uh, they go through life looking at all their problems and, 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 and saying, well, woe is me. But you are rich. You are rich in grace. You are rich in mercy. You are rich in rewards in the kingdom of heaven. You are rich in the love of God. The richness that we can't even comprehend, the riches of Christ. Behold the riches of Christ. He's so rich in, in mercy in Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, so he is made, God made unto us righteousness. As our sin is made up to him, his righteousness to us, and his having fulfilled all the righteousness of the law for us as our representative. The innocent was punished voluntarily as if guilty, and that the guilty might be gratuitously rewarded as if innocent. Such are we in the sight of God the Father, as is the very Son of God himself. I, I like that statement, but I also want to make a, add a little bit to it in that uh, we became rich because of his poverty. Because he took upon him the sin, we take upon us the righteousness of God. What do I have to do with that? What do I have to do with him taking upon my sin? Nothing. In Romans chapter 5, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We didn't ask him to. We didn't give him permission to. He did it uh, as the plan of God. And he took upon us our sin for us because in our capacity as sinners, we would never do it for ourselves. We would look at the impossible and say, what's the use? I can't do it anyway. I have sinned, so I can't even be that sacrifice. But Christ took upon him the sin of the world, the plan of the Father. He became sin. And so because of that, uh, those who believe on him become the righteousness of God. I don't earn it. I don't deserve it. I don't feel it most of the time. Many people, including Christians, if you say to them, Hey, do you feel righteous right now? They say, No, no. Did you do something wrong? Well, not really, but I just don't feel righteous. Well, you're, you're stating a, a, another truth. You, righteousness isn't a feeling, but so many people turn into a feeling, feeling, including ministers and pastors who try and put it on their congregation. You should be feeling righteous today. Righteousness isn't a feeling. It's a state that God has put us into. Mm -hmm. It's a positional truth that I have, whether it's a feeling or not. And it, it's a blessing when I ex we comprehend this, as I comprehend sin, and I can understand that God took upon him my sin. It's a blessing when I can understand that God put upon me his righteousness. And you know what it's like? It's like this. I mean, I, I know maybe you've heard it, maybe not, but every, every now and then you hear a news story on the news about somebody... Who's, who they discovered living in total poverty. 
and they, they found them in a, in a slum in a certain city, and they're living like a hermit, and they, they got all di they're all disheveled, and they're dirty, and they're ripped clothes, and they say, and do you know that this person is a millionaire? And they, they have millions in the bank, but they chose to live like this? And you go, that's a, I can't understand that. They must be have a mental problem. Whatever the reason is, they are living like a pauper, and they were a millionaire. And, and, and because they choose to live like a pauper, doesn't change the fact that everybody knows when they find out, hey, he's a millionaire. He's got $5 million in the bank. And he knows it, but he wants to live like a pauper. And you say, so is he a pauper or is he a millionaire? And everyone goes, no, he's a millionaire. He has it in the bank. It's, it's right there on his bank statement, $5 million. He can, he can eat at the best restaurants, go anywhere he wants in the world, dress in the finest clothes, but he chooses to live like this. And isn't that like you and I with righteousness? It's exactly like that. We have been declared righteous by God, not because we've earned it or because we behave like it, but because we have it, because it's God's righteousness in us, the great exchange God's economy he be, he who was rich became poor so that we who were poor might become rich and and, and like we have the five million dollars in righteousness it's in our bank account it's ours to use as we wish to use as as and lavish it upon ourselves and use it for our benefit and our good and then we live like paupers still trying to figure out how can I become righteous how can I live like God does? How can I, I can't, so I'll live like a pauper. And I, and I live like I don't have anything when I have everything that, that I need, which is the righteousness of God. And we call that person crazy who does that, so shouldn't we call ourselves crazy if we don't live according to the righteousness of God? Shame on us uh, when we allow a feeling or not a feeling uh, of righteousness to affect the way we live as believers. When God has declared us to be righteous, and he has made that his way because why? He served among us in sin. He became a servant unto sin and went to the cross and took upon him the sin of the whole world. And, and when we receive him as our Savior, and that's the, the, if you want to come up with a requirement of God for anything, uh, it's to receive the gift of eternal life. The wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So when I got, when I got saved, and I said that prayer, uh, not really understanding the depth, the depth and the height and the breadth of that amazing prayer of salvation and the benefits that God would bestow upon me. But when I did say that, God imputed righteousness unto me. It was imputed. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. And it's, you can't even say that, well, Abraham's act of, of believing was what made him righteous. No. No, he, he I believe God for a, a prayer that someone said, if you want to go to heaven, when you die, receive Christ as your Savior. Okay, I didn't, no one talked to me anything about righteous or being righteous. I didn't even understand the concept. But God imputed righteousness to me because the penalty of my sin, the problem of sin in the world was settled in Christ, his Son. And so God is, is free because his justice of, uh, of, uh, of the, the penalty for sin was, was met in Christ at the cross, satisfied totally, and you cannot mete out the same punishment again after you've already done it once in the judicial system. We're, we're going back to the word equity. It's equitable. Uh, so we can't pay for our sin again. It's already been paid for. And so in that same sense, uh, we can... A righteousness is imputed to us not just righteous behavior or righteous feeling uh, righteousness of God what is right what is good 
what is fair, what is the mind of God, what is the plan of God. That is in me. I have that inside of me. And you say, well, why don't I act like that then? Because you're still looking and living like a pauper. You don't believe it. You have not because you ask not, and you don't ask because you don't believe. Uh, you don't believe that you're worthy of it, you don't believe you can, but we already have the righteousness of God inside of us. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 28 to 30, but of him you are in Christ Jesus, which is made unto us righteousness and holiness and justice in God. Of him you are. Look, look at this verse. Uh, by the way, that's 2 Corinthians 8, 9, uh, on the rich and poor. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Great verse. Mm -hmm. Look at that. Uh, Philip, Romans 5, 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him, of him that was to come, which is Christ. But then I wanted to read you these verses in Romans 10. Maybe we'll close with this. Uh, Paul speaking of the, the, the nation of Israel again, but we can easily apply it to ourselves today as Christians, as believers, uh, when it comes to understanding and, and following after righteousness. Not an act, not a feeling, but a state that we, live, that we have inside of us already. Um, we have concepts of what righteousness looks like, and, and many times that, that concept is, is a holy, just God sitting on a throne uh, with looking of scorn in his eyes on all unrighteousness and sinner of which I know I am, and I tend to want to hide from that, or the right self-righteous Pharisee who looks down his nose upon me because I'm not living right. And guess what? Sometimes we have that going on inside of us, like a schizophrenic uh, um, person uh, who sometimes does wrong and then judges themselves for doing wrong and enters into self-condemnation over their sin uh, because they're trying to attain unto a righteousness which is not of God, but of themselves and of the law. See it here. Romans 10, verse 2. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. See, there it is right there. We have a knowledge of God and what is right and what the definition is, and we can't live up to it, and we become ignorant of it because we try to live into a standard of righteousness, which is our own righteousness, relative righteousness, self-righteousness, uh, a, a, a standard that can, tends to put down people and, and look down upon people, including ourselves when we commit it, uh, and so we can never receive grace for it because we're always looking at our faults and our weaknesses and our sins and measuring ourselves by ourselves. And then we certainly think that God isn't happy with us. Uh, so um, we're ignorant of God's righteousness because we're trying to establish our own righteousness. And we can't. And we can't. No matter how good we are for a time, all of our, this is what it means, and I know some people hate this verse, but so what? All of our righteousness is as filthy rags to God. Mm -hmm. All of it, and I say all of it. I, 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 I'm, but I've been good for a while, and I just slipped up once. All of it, all of your righteousness is like a filthy rag to God because his righteousness is on a different level, and it's his righteousness that has been imputed to us, not mine. 
not my good behavior, not the ability to behave myself now that I'm a Christian. No, I don't have that ability. I only have Christ who, who, who can do that through me uh, by changing me, not reinforming me, but changing me. And so it's not like I'm now in this program where I, I try and be, like they say about alcoholism and alcoholics, they say, well, let's hope that the cycle gets bigger, you know? You say, well, an alcoholic, he fails all the time, or a drug user. And they, 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 you get clean, and then they, they last a week, and they go back again. And then they get clean again, and they go for two weeks, and they go back again. And then they get clean, and you go, well, let's hope the cycle gets bigger this time. And that's okay to do that. Uh, but, but that's how we view our Christian walk sometimes. Well, let's hope my sin gets less and the cycle of being righteous gets bigger the next time. And you say, well, isn't that grown in grace and knowledge? Sort of. As long as I'm not imputing the, the, the sin to myself again when I fail and striving to be good so I gain acceptance with God. No, then it's, it's not the same. Grown in grace and knowledge is me accepting already the righteousness that God has given me and walking in it. And when I sin, I acknowledge it and confess it and go on because it's been dealt with at the cross. And it's not who I am anymore. I'm, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. And that's who I am. And so I don't condemn myself when I sin. I acknowledge it, confess it, and I go on in the righteousness that God has imputed to me. Not earned it, not deserved it, and I certainly don't feel it. So, but, I, but I have it. It's mine. And I have the ability to to manifest it in my life and manifest it to others uh, who in my life. That righteousness of God where there's no condemnation, there's no shame, there's no guilt, there's no punishment, there's no scornful looks from God. No, that's not the heart of God. Go back to Isaiah 43 of what he said about the children of Israel. I, you will show forth my praise. You, you've not regarded me in your heart. You're not doing this. You're, you're regarding iniquity, but you are going to show forth my praise. You and I, when we operate in the righteousness that God has given us, we show forth his praise. Mm -hmm. we, we can't help it, but we show forth it. But listen to this. Uh, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. And there's the problem. There is the problem. We have not submitted ourselves to this righteousness. And what is it? You know, that's a, 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 in Christian circles and jokes sometimes in marriages, sub submission is an ugly word. You know, wives don't want to submit to their husbands. They don't like it when they read in the Bible. Submit to your husbands like it's this horrible thing. And so whenever we read a word about submitting, it becomes this horrible thing. And I know there's some spiritual ladies out there that, that don't have a problem with submission, my wife being one of them. It's, it's not, it's it, 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 when you understand submission. But we, you and I, when we go around giving up on trying to be righteous because we're trying to be righteous and we stop trying to be righteous and we say, I can't do this, and you should just say, oh, that's good. Now just operating the righteousness of God and stop trying to be righteous. Submit yourselves to the righteousness of God. The word submit, uh, hupo meno, come under. Come under the righteousness of God. I can't do my own righteousness, and even if I can, to God it's a filthy rag, and I can't, I don't feel it, and I'm probably never going to feel righteous, because as long as I have a sin nature attached to me, I could come to a place where I feel righteous because I've been good for a week, but then on the following day I blow it, and then I feel unrighteous again. And I can't live in a feeling of being righteous or unrighteous I'm, as I'm not designed to live according to a feeling of it, just like many other things with God. I just have to operate and submit to the righteousness of God that is in me, and it's in me because the sin of the world was put upon his son. And when the sin, what uh, the original cause of all the manifestations that we see of it, uh, as it was dealt with, then, then I can operate in this righteousness. It's available to me. It's in me. 
I, I, it, it's like the papa with the million dollars in the bank. I just have to say, no, you know what? You're right. I mean, I, I have money. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go buy a suit. I'm going to go do this. I have the righteousness of God. I can live in that righteousness and not have it be a striving thing, but have it just be the reality of who I am in Christ Jesus because of the death of his son by taking upon the sin of the world on Calvary. That's amazing. There's a lot to think about here today, and I've said a lot. It'd probably be, you could do four or five messages on this, uh, uh, but think, just think about it. We get so hung up on righteousness that we do uh, about trying to, to understand and comprehend it and and not and um, if you want to be honest many of us give up on even talking about it because we 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 know that we're not and it's a good place to start just know that you're not and you can't be uh, unless you have the righteousness of God and that's already been given to you if you're a believer today it's already been given to you it's one of the gifts of God his righteousness in us not deserving, not earned, not feeling, but yet it's there. Like the five million dollars, yet it's there. Will I tap into it? That's up to me. But I can. And, and what does that mean? Do I go around putting in prayers in front of my face and doing what the Pharisees, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you can know us. No. No, they were doing a performance to try and earn favor and show that they were godly and all this. But ours exceeds it because we already have it. I don't need to do all those things to show that I'm righteous. I'm already righteous because Christ did all those things, including dying for my sin on the cross. And so I just operate in, in, in what Christ has done, and that includes being uh, considered righteous by God. And so what does that produce in my in my walk in my life it, or what it should produce is peace i'm submitting myself to the righteousness of god as he submitted himself to the sin of uh, and the penalty of it of the cross he humbled himself and became obedient even unto the death of the cross he paid the total price and it wasn't like uh, I'm just doing this, but I really didn't do it. No, he actually became sin for us. I got in trouble for this once. <laughs> uh, somebody could not understand how I could say that. when it, I didn't say it. The Bible says it. He who knew no sin became sin, singular, sin of the world, took on him the sin of the world. He, God's plan, he did that willingly without my consent, uh, if you don't like to think of Christ in those terms, then you have a problem with God. Read Isaiah 53, verse 11. How could it please God to bruise him unless he had become sin? That's why it pleased God to bruise him. We can't wrap our minds around that. How could it be please God to bruise his son? Because at that moment, he was sin, not his son. And so he, he poured out his wrath upon that sin, which was ours, because he never sinned but it was ours. And so God is totally free because of that to give us his righteousness. It's not, and it's not um, uh, an unfair thing and it's not uh, something that's momentarily and it's not based on my behavior or my feeling. It's based on what Christ did for my sin and the sin of the world at Calvary. And, and, and shame, like again, shame on us if we don't serve righteousness like we've served sin. All of us have served sin. And we've given into it, and uh, we've experienced the wages of it, the, the death of it. Yes, some of us have experienced pleasure in sin. Uh, you know, people have gone out and gotten high, and it's pleasurable, and, and say, oh, I, I felt so great on it, but it was a sin. And, and, and people have committed sins and, and experienced pleasure out of it, but there's a wage to that sin, and it's death. You can't get around that. There just is. And, and some people think they can get away with it, but you can't get around it. And, and, and Christ experienced that wage. And, and, and so why, why shouldn't we experience uh, th that reward that, that it comes to us as a result of identifying with that 
what Christ did for us and accept in it. And that is to be have the righteousness of God in us. And again, I'll just close with this because I can't emphasize it enough. You know, I'd love to go out in the other room and come back in dressed up in a robe and, and all these things on me and little tassels hanging down and the, the word of God in front of my eyes and say, look at me, look at me, I'm righteous now. And say, oh, you look like an idiot. Uh, and I might, but I could, that could be my concept of what righteousness looks like. Or I could be like one of those guys, I'm just walking around and looking down the long nose of looking down at those who, who don't, believe, don't behave like I do, don't have the same belief system as me, and oh, those poor people, like the Pharisee in the temple, you know, uh, and, the, and he can like, thank you, God, that I'm not like these people. I'm not like this beggar over here, this publican, and all of that, that, that kind of righteousness. Uh, no, I, I tap into the righteousness of God, which is what? It's, it's like the wisdom from above in James 3.17, right? It's pure, it's peaceable, it's gentle, it's easy to be entreated. It's without hypocrisy and without partiality. The wisdom of God is the righteousness of God. It's who he is. It's his character and his nature inside of me. And I can tap into that righteousness and abide in God and abide in that life, in my life now, and operate in it by faith. A judge shall live by faith, by faith. I, it's not, it can't be about a feeling. It can't be about a show. And it can't be about an appearance. It has to be about a, a nature that has come inside of me, and that nature is the righteousness of God in me. And I'm free to access it and have it because my sin problem was dealt with uh, by Christ on the cross. Mm -hmm. So I, I hope you understand that a little bit. Maybe we'll talk about it some more. It's a, it's a, a deep subject, and you have to think about it a lot, but it's worth it. Because if we can be set free from self-righteousness or trying to attain unto righteousness, and trying to strive with our walk because we're not, we don't feel righteous, then we will really have a life that's different, a, a changed life, uh, the know of freedom, uh, that, that uh, I'm free to love God and have him love me, and there's an exchange there because I'm not hiding from him because I feel unrighteous today. No, I just claim his righteousness upon my life, which is my right to do and what God has has planned for me to do. So let's do it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, that all of this that we said is all because of you and your plan and what you said. You, I, We will show forth your praise. We will, uh, by submitting to righteousness, by believing uh, by faith in Christ dying for our sins on the cross, the sin of the world, the manifestation of all sins, but the sin problem that we are righteous. And, and uh, you did it all, Lord. Your, the work is finished, John 17, 4, 19, 30. It is finished. There's nothing that can be added to it or nothing that can be taken from it. The work is perfect. It is complete. And it is your plan and your perfect work, our righteousness, your work. We just, we just, we just tap into it. Lord, uh, if somebody watching today has never received you as Savior, say this prayer. Wouldn't you want to know him after hearing that today? Wouldn't you want to have the righteousness of Christ inside of you? Yes. Say this prayer, dear Lord Jesus, I want your righteousness in me. I receive you as Savior right now. Thank you for dying for me. And ask God to come in and watch what happens in your life, in your soul, in your heart, the peace that God will give you. And uh, and learn of him. Take the time to learn of him. Father, for us who have received you, Lord, help us to know what it means to submit to your righteousness. Not just to know it uh, the concept of it, but to submit to it, the fact that it's in us already, the fact that it's available, that it's ours, that there's no requirement to experience it because the requirement's been made at Calvary, Lord. We thank you for that. 
bless each one today, and we just love you and praise you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Hope you enjoyed that. Um, think about it. Uh, meditate on it. Might have to listen to it again a few times. Been doing a lot of studying on it, and uh, there's more to be done. But God bless you. We'll see you on Wednesday back at the church. Come, come and join us on Wednesday if you can. It's a great time. We have a great fellowship on Wednesday night, and of course next Sunday morning we'll be back in Peabody, uh, 15 Lynn Street, Peabody, Mass. Uh, Sunday at 10.30. Hope you can join us. God bless.